Father, thank you once again for the privilege of being able to hear your word. Father, it is so desperately needed, and uh, especially by those of us who've heard it many times, Lord, but uh, the soil has become a little hard. Maybe we've become numb to it, Lord. Maybe, maybe life has made us just cynical or just too sad, Lord, or just we've given up, we've hunkered down, and uh, perhaps even inadvertently have just stepped over the hidden kingdom, Lord, moved on in pursuit of other things. I pray this morning that you would break up that hard soil and help us to hear your word, Lord. Help us to hear your voice while we still can hear it, Lord. You have some important things to say to us. I pray that you would speak through me. I know I'm not worthy, Lord, and I'm not adequate, and I feel the weight of that each week. But I'm here, Lord, and I'm ready. So I pray you would speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, this is the last one, the last message in our excavation series unearthing the buried kingdom. It's based on a verse, Matthew 13, verse 44, where Jesus spoke about the kingdom of heaven being like a buried treasure. A man who found it, hid it quickly because he knew what it was, and he wanted it. So he went and sold everything he had so he could buy the field because the field possessed the treasure. And we talked about how the kingdom of God, Jesus said, is very much like that hidden treasure. It's there waiting to be discovered, but more often than not, it isn't. And it's so important that you and I, who say we know the Lord and love him, that we understand what he's talking about, and that we not let this be what happens to us. We've already seen that there are different aspects of this hidden treasure, the kingdom of God, which today is the church. We saw that it is about a coalition. It's about recovery of lost things, lost people. It's about mercy. It's about desire. Last week we saw that it was about legitimacy. And today we're going to see the final aspect, and that is the kingdom of God, this buried kingdom that gets missed, is about community. And I got to tell you that I think one of the most important things for the people of God in the days ahead is going to be community. God wants to build a community of faith and too many of his people don't understand that. But he's going to make it clear He's going to make it real clear in the days ahead, dear ones. And I'm going to explain to you today how he's going to do that. And I'm going to tell you up front, you're not going to like it. Turn, if you will, to the New Testament book of Acts. Acts is basically an account by Luke, a physician who partnered with Paul in taking the gospel to the world in the first century. Luke was a highly educated man and goes about recording the events of the first century which he knew were important. He knew these things needed to be preserved for future generations. And I'm thankful for the account that he gives us. He picks up his story where he had left off in his gospel account with the resurrection of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, we see Luke describes after Jesus had risen and reunited with his disciples that he taught them for a certain period of time. He revealed himself to many, many people so there would be no doubt about the fact of his resurrection. And then he told them as he had taught them earlier that it was time for him to go and return to his father but that he wasn't going to leave them as orphans. And so it says that he ascended into heaven as they watched. 
And then angels have to disperse them and tell them, listen, you need to go about what he told you to do. So they do. And then 50 days after Pentecost, during a Jewish festival known as the, the, the Feast of Weeks, they're up in an upper room, they're praying, and they are covered, inundated, saturated, visited by the Holy Spirit, and it has a miraculous effect. One of the byproducts of the Holy Spirit coming to this New, New Testament church was that the apostles and the other believers were supernaturally empowered to start sharing the good news about everything that had happened during the life of Jesus. And Peter, who was one of the more outgoing of the apostles, and certainly perhaps one of the most grateful for Christ forgiving him for his failure, starts sharing, he starts preaching, and the power of the Holy Spirit enables him to do it so amazingly, so supernaturally, that 3,000 people get saved. And this is the formal establishment of the New Testament church. And not just 3,000 people, but the Bible says 3,000 men. And in Hebrew culture, that was just another way of saying a head of a household. Marriage was essential to every Israeli. Very highly valued. And, and beyond that, having children, which means that if 3,000 people, 3,000 men were saved, you could probably quadruple that number as to the total people that were a part of the church. And this starts the Jerusalem congregation headquartered by the apostles. That's Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 3, as, as this new church is beginning to establish itself, get organized, and do what God has called them to do, one day Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray. At this time, Christianity and Judaism were still closely affiliated in that it was done in the same place. But they were separate beliefs. And as Peter and John are on the way to the temple, they encounter a man. He's disabled, he's begging, and they heal him. When they do crowds assemble, as you might imagine, and they begin to marvel at what had happened, and so Peter wastes no time, and he begins to preach to the assembled crowd. And it was a big crowd. The temple was a hub of activity anyway in Jerusalem. And so he preaches another sermon, and 2,000 more men are added to the church. That's how powerfully the apostles, who weren't trained priests or ministers, they were fishermen, but this is what God can do through even an ordinary person. So now you have 5,000 people, or probably closer, somewhere between 20 and 30,000 people in the city of Jerusalem, and they're now a part of this fledgling church. Acts chapter 3, now we're moving to Acts chapter 4. Word of what they've done gets back to the Jerusalem, the Jewish religious leaders. The temple guard are dispatched, and Peter and John are arrested. They're brought the next day before the Sanhedrin, the ruling body, and they have to defend their actions. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, boldly declares to this body, who by and large were responsible for the death of Christ, he declares that the man was healed by the power of Jesus, the very Messiah that they had crucified, but whom God had raised from the dead to become humanity's only hope of salvation. The council, of course, is enraged by this, both at the accusation that they have murdered the Messiah or done anything wrong, and also by the fact that they're spreading this message to the people and the people are responding. So they do what they always do. They breathe threats. They tell Peter and John, you had better shut up with this message. If you don't stop spreading this message, this lie, this heresy in the community, we'll do to you what we did to this Jesus. 
Peter and John respond with a rhetorical question. And they ask the Sanhedrin, well, then you tell us. Should we listen to the threats, to the commands of men, or to the command of God? And then they say, we cannot and we will not be silent. Now, the Sanhedrin is really afraid to move against Peter and John at this time, just as they had been afraid to move against Jesus in the early days because they feared what the crowds might do. They feared there might be a riot. And it wasn't the crowd per se they were afraid of. What they were afraid of was the Romans. They were afraid if there was unrest in the city that the Roman government would move in with soldiers and quell the riot and then remove them from power because they couldn't keep the peace. So they don't move against Peter and John at this time, but they, I'm sure, begin to plot against them, and they warn them one, one last time. Listen, we're telling you, and you'd better listen. If you defy us, if we get wind that you're out sharing this message anymore, you know what will happen to you. There shouldn't be any doubt in your mind about that because we've already proved what we're capable of. Then they release Peter and John. They return to the church and meet with the other apostles and the leaders of the church and tell them what happened. The church wisely goes to prayer and they begin to ask God, and this is amazing, for the power and for the courage to not be afraid. Instead of fretting and wondering and thinking, what are we going to do? We got to have a plan. Should we leave the city? Instead, no, they go right to God and they say, listen, Lord, we know what we need to do. What we need is the courage and the strength to do it. Will you please help us? And as they begin to pray, the foundation of the building that they're in begins to tremble like an earthquake. And the entire assembly of those who are praying are again filled miraculously with the Holy Spirit. And the result of it is that they leave that room and begin going throughout the city of Jerusalem fearlessly. Fearlessly. Even knowing the threat that's looming and knowing that it's legitimate, they fearlessly start preaching the good news. So what happened? That brings us to our passage Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32. It says, and now here we're going to have a description of what the first century church looked like. You know, one of the biggest things that people tend to do in the American church today is shop for churches. Now, back in the day, it used to be you, you picked a church. Half the time you were born into a church. You went to the church that your family went to, and you stayed there your whole life. There was a real loyalty and a sense of community. That has been lost. In today's culture, it's all about shopping. And churches realize that and thus have embraced what the world does, and that is marketing. Churches market themselves to niche audiences. Literally, I have been amazed by some of the advertisements I've seen. Or if you go to church webpage web pages or Facebook pages, and you, you, well, we have this, we offer that, we can do this, we can do that. They show you pictures, and it's, and it's almost like it's a competition. We'll, we'll beat any church's price. Come on down. And that's how Christians have developed their idea about what church is. Going to church is like buying a car. It's great at the beginning. It even smells great. There's nothing like it. And you drive it, and you're proud, and you tell everybody about it. And then after a few years pass, eh, you know, I, I kind of like some of these other cars that are out there. I think I might upgrade. And that's what we do. It, you're you're going to see here that this church was very, very different. Verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Isn't it interesting that the first thing it says about this church is that they shared possessions? You know why that is? 
Because the Jerusalem church was being persecuted. These Jewish religious leaders' threats, they weren't idle. Word went out into the community of Jerusalem that if anyone in your family or in your employ or in your circle of friends embraces this so-called Messiah, Jesus, if they become followers of the way, not only will we deal with them, but we will deal with you unless you separate yourself. It doesn't matter if they are your spouse, your child, your relative, your friend, your slave, your employee, anyone will be dealt with and their associates as well. And so the cost of being a Christian got real high real fast. As a result, a lot of people who used to benefit financially because their businesses were tied to the Jewish community in Jerusalem couldn't do business anymore because people wouldn't shop at their shops. Family members got cast out of the family. They weren't being cared for anymore. There's a real sense of, 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 of to this day, the Jews are very tight-knit community. They've had to be because they're surrounded by enemies. Well, can you imagine if you're suddenly cast out of that community? Your family won't talk to you. Your friends won't talk to you. You can't find work. You can't do business. The haves and the have-nots in the church were obvious, and there were a lot more have-nots than there were haves. And that meant that a lot of these people that were embracing Christ were suddenly faced with a financial reality that they couldn't meet their needs. What was the church going to do? What do you do when people don't have food? They don't have shelter. The church had to address it. How did they do it? Well, it says that, first of all, they were one in heart and mind. In Greek, the two words that Luke chooses are very, very interesting. Heart in Greek is cardia. That probably sounds familiar to you. It's the root of our English word cardiac or cardiology. It has to do with the heart. And in Greek thought, the cardia was the core of emotional desire and passion. And we understand that. We're coming up on Valentine's Day, right? Every card you look at is shaped like a heart. They're selling pizzas that are shaped like a heart. We understand that the heart is supposed to be the emotional center, and that's the way the Greeks thought of it as well. But not just the core of emotional desire. It says that they were also one in mind. In Greek, the word is suke. It is the root of our English word psyche or psychiatry, or psychology. It has to do with the intellect, the identity, the will, the mind. So these people were knit together in every aspect of human experience, both their passions, their heart, their emotions, their feelings, and their minds, the way they identified themselves, the way they thought about things, the way they reasoned. It was all lumped together. These people had a common bond they were unified by, first of all, who they loved, what they believed, and how they lived. What was the result of that? No one in this congregation looked at their possessions as being their own. In Greek, the word no one is udeheis, and it means not one. Not one of these 5,000 families headed by these men thought of their possessions as their own. Are you kidding me? There's always one, usually more than one. Matter of fact, it would be easier, it would be harder today to find one in today's church than to not find one. Back then, not one. Isn't it fascinating that they had such a sense of unity and family and selfless concern for others? If there was someone in need in this congregation, and there were a lot of people in need, the people who had means, the people who were perhaps independently wealthy or from wealthy families or had made their money doing other things, they immediately saw an obligation to help those who had real need. And when I say real need, I'm talking about real need. 
There's no food. There's no place to live. And it says that not one person in this congregation that had means looked at their possessions as being more important than the need of the people in the congregation. That is powerful. How on earth does this happen? Not only did they not hold anything back, but they considered everything that they owned just a resource, just something that belonged to God and that they were just stewards of it. Why? Because of what was said earlier. They were one in heart and one in mind. They had found Jesus. They had dug up and unearthed the buried treasure. And now, just like it says in the story where the man sold everything he had so they could have the field, these people looked at their possessions as being nothing to them other than a means to an end. They had been saved by Jesus. They were grateful to Jesus. They were experiencing incredible power and true wealth because of their dynamic relationship with Jesus. And it changed everything for them. They stopped looking at earthly possessions the way everybody and their brother does. And trust me, as a pastor, this is the last thing we give to God, is our money. Oh, we'll give them our heart and we'll give them our mind six ways to Sunday, but we won't give them our money unless we absolutely have to, which tells you that everything was surrendered. It also tells you that if you have really discovered who Jesus is, then you find that you don't really want or need anything else. That's one of the ways you know that you truly have discovered him. And conversely, if you don't really know Jesus then that other stuff is all that matters to you. Verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Okay, what had they prayed for? They had prayed for the power to not be afraid. Do you ever pray for that? Have you ever prayed for the power to not be afraid? It feels like to me today... This is about all I pray for. I, I'm constantly praying for God to give me the power to not be afraid. And I have discovered that the way he does that is by helping you to see the way things really are. Because it's easy. Remember I told you before that, that the world we live in is essentially an illusion? And it can convince you of all kinds of lies. When you're able to see beyond that and to really see the reality of what God is doing, your fear begins to melt. If you're afraid all the time, it's because you are not seeing things for the way they really are. And it says that as they have prayed for the power to not be afraid, it says that they had great power given to them. The word great in Greek is megale. It's the root of our English term mega. You know, we know what mega means. That's exactly what it meant in Greek. It meant enormous size, enormous weight, enormous stature. And the second word, power, is dunamē. It's the root of our English word dynamic or dynasty or dynamite. And it means overwhelming force or energy. So they had prayed that God would help them not be afraid. And the Bible says that God's spirit descended on them, and when the Spirit came, they were filled with overwhelming power, force, energy. And that allowed the apostles to proclaim the gospel without fear and effectively. When they went out and shared the good news, people were changed by it. Now think about this, because individuals in Jerusalem would have known, hey, if I listen to this story about this risen Christ, if I listen to it and if I'm swayed by it or if somebody I love is swayed by it, there is a cost to it. It isn't just, well, that means 
you know, once every two or three months I'll have to go to church. And whatever spare change I got in my pocket because I forget to take it out before I go, I'll have to put it in for a collection. And every once in a while, maybe they'll do something that I might show up or not show up. No, there was a cost to giving your heart to Christ. And yet the apostles are so powerfully filled by the Holy Spirit that when they start sharing with people, they're swayed. The Bible says that God was adding to their number every single day, which means they were sharing their faith every day, and it was powerful. Why isn't this happening today? Why does it take so much? We look at big churches and we think, well, it's happening there. No, it isn't, not by and large. Study after study has shown that the way big churches get big is by vacuuming people from little churches. Now, there is some evangelism that goes on cumulatively, and I'm not bad-mouthing big churches. It's wonderful. I wish this was a big church, okay? So I'm not bad-mouthing it, but I am saying just the fact of it is it's, it's tricking us into thinking that there's a lot more good stuff going on in, in the realm of the kingdom of God today than actually is. What it is is people looking at their church and looking at a big church and saying, you know what, I'm going to upgrade. I want to go to the place where everybody knows your name. So, here you have something different going on. Why, why isn't it happening today? You know what? I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. And it's going to shock you, I think. It says the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection. This was and is the core of the gospel message. The core of what we tell people or, or what we're supposed to tell people when we go out and try to share what we believe with others, the core of it is that Jesus raised from death. This is what separates Christianity from every other religion. Is that our Messiah, our Savior, is risen from death. He's the only one. And the Bible says he's the only one who has salvation as a result of it. And what's interesting is that these guys, these apostles, went out sharing this message even though they knew that it was going to lead to adversity, persecution, and for some of them, it was going to cost them their lives. Some of the early apostles were told went through great hardship. Great hardship. And the first thing we jettison when things get really difficult are the things we don't really believe. You're not going to go to your death for something that you're not sure is true or that for sure you know is a lie. And yet these guys stood their ground and, and under powerful duress, unlike probably anything you and I could even imagine, they stood their ground and they said no. Jesus raised from the dead. And if it costs me everything, I'm, that's my message. And you want to know what's interesting? Do you know what one of the greatest evidences, besides being willing to undergo persecution, one of the greatest evidences of the fact that Jesus really had risen was in the first century church? You know what it was? It's what's being described here. It's the fact that these people no longer looked at material possessions the way every person out there looks at material possessions. The fact that they no longer clung to wealth and, and said, no, mine, was evidence that they had found something that trans, transcended the normal human perspective of life. And it was that Christ had resurrected. And because of that, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. The word powerfully, again, is megale, enormous, and grace is charis. In Greek, the word charis or grace means to reach across with favor toward another. It's always described as more in the Bible than forgiveness. When you and I think about God's grace, we always think about forgiveness. It's about forgiveness. And yes, it is about forgiveness, but it is about so much more. Grace in the Bible is always described as a force for transformation. Whenever you read about God's grace coming to bear on a situation or on a person, 
It's about the transformational effect that it has. You cannot experience God's grace and remain the same. You can't. It's impossible. So this grace is a work of power. And it changed them. It changed their perspective on money and on possessions and toward one another. These people were selling homes and possessions to help people they didn't even know. Who does that? They did that. Because something power was, powerful was going on. Verse 34. And it was so powerful that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales. We'll stop there. It says there were no needy persons among them. And yet there were a lot of needy people because I've already told you that it was difficult to be a Christian. There was a lot of persecution. So why were there no needy people? Because there were so many people who were looking out for it. And they were selling things they had in order that there would not be any needy people. Do you want to know something? This is a fulfillment of something God had promised years before. Back in Deuteronomy, you know that book you never read? Deuteronomy, it said when God was talking to his people about when they were about to go into Canaan, Deuteronomy 15, 4, there need be no poor people among you. For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. God told the Israelis, you know what, we're going to wipe out poverty when I take you in there because there's going to be so much wealth that you're going to be able to take care of the poor and everybody will have enough. Isn't that fascinating? That, that was God's design? So how did that work? Was it, you know, and here's where we get into some argument with, with some people who think, well, yeah, of course, because the New Testament church, it, it was a commune. It was communism. It was socialism. That's why it's so important that we embrace that, because that's what the church was. You take from the rich and you give to the poor. That, that, that's what it is. No, that is not what is taught in the New Testament. The church wasn't a commune. It wasn't a monastery. It wasn't a socialist state. Why? Because in those things, giving is mandatory. If you establish a socialist state or if you establish a commune, or if you establish a monastery, going in, you know, everything you have becomes ours. And usually that's a separate entity. And we'll decide what's best, and you'll just be a drone like everybody else. And the Bible never teaches that. It says that the people from time to time, okay, not, not all the time, but from time to time, when a need arose, people voluntarily sold things to meet those needs. It wasn't compulsory. It was love-driven. That's the difference. These people did it not because they had to, but because they wanted to, which is way more impressive. Listen, you give the choice of, well, you can make a donation or you don't have to make a donation. Ten out of ten. Well, then I'll pass. You ever have that little thing on the ATM at the store? Would you like to make a donation? Unless there's somebody looking at you or asking you about it, it, dude, no. I don't care what it is, no. These people voluntarily gave because they cared about the other people, even if they didn't know who they were. It says those who owned land or houses did this, which means that even in the church, there were some who had wealth, whereas many, many others didn't. And those who did have the wealth, who had been blessed by God, saw that as an opportunity to minister to other people. It says they put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed, verse 35, to anyone who had need. To put it at the, uh, the apostles' feet meant to, basically was another way of saying, here's what we have, we've heard there's a need, and we're trusting you to take care of it. I like the fact that they don't put strings on it. Okay, now I'm giving this to you, but I'm going to need to know that um, at some point my name's going to get mentioned. Or is there a plaque or something with my name on it that I'm going to get, that, you know, so that commemorates? You know, is there a wall of, of uh, contribution here somewhere where my name's going to be up? Ever go to a place like a big hospital or something? There's always a wall, right, with everybody's name on there that gave, you know, whatever, because that's human nature. 
They don't want credit for it. And another thing I notice is that they don't want control. They don't come to the apostles and they say, okay, well, here's, here's some money. We've heard there's a need, but there are a few caveats. We don't want any money going to this. We don't want these people getting anything. I don't want it spent on that. Here's what I want it spent on. You'd be surprised how much giving in the church is conditioned like that. And the Bible makes it very clear. No, that is idolatry. You don't pick. If you, listen, if you can't give freely and trust in God and who God has chosen, then, then don't give at all. You don't get to be in control. This is about submission to those that God has ordained. So it was put under the apostles' discretion to be dispensed as it was determined. Having said that, there were guidelines in the first century church about money that came in. It was always, there was a standard as to who qualified and who didn't. They just didn't hand money out willy-nilly. They were very careful about distributing because they knew the funds were limited and they knew that there was a trust involved in that money being given. And so they always made sure. I mean, you can read about it in Acts chapter 6, 1 Timothy 5, 2 Thessalonians 3. There were a lot of different regulations about who received charity and who didn't and why. So there was great caution in the distribution of these funds, but they were distributed, and the church was the center. Today, the church isn't the center. Who do people look to today if they have need? The state. Always, right? The state has taken that from us. But back then, the church was the one looked to. And what's interesting is that as a part of this, there's going to be a young man who's going to come along. He's from the island of Cyprus, a young Jewish man. And he's from means. He comes from a wealthy family. And when he joins this Jerusalem church, the indication is he's probably one of the ones that gets won to Christ by Peter's message or by John's message. He comes and he starts, he, he sells some property and he brings it and he lays it at the apostles' feet. And this is going to be his introduction to the church. And he's going to go on to do some pretty amazing things. But it starts with his generous heart. They began to call him the son of encouragement. His name was Barnabas. All right, so what is community in the kingdom of God supposed to look like? What should it look like today? What should it look like today? Three things from the story. First of all, it involves purpose. The kingdom of God has a purpose. God has something he wants to do. Remember I told you last week, that God is wanting to reveal himself because he wants people to revere him. He wants to make his name great. That is part of his purpose. His purpose is that people should know his son Jesus so that they can be saved. And that is what the church is supposed to be about. About making God known so that he can be revered. And it is preeminent. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Hear that phrase again? In mind and in thought, you ought to be united. You know, what breaks my heart is that one of the most divided places on earth, it seems, are churches. Churches can't seem to agree on anything. I'm not talking one church to another. I'm talking inside the walls. There is so much division. And you know why? Because we prioritize our agenda above God's. Whenever you have a fight in a church, whenever you have a split in a church, whenever you have somebody leaving or arguing, it's always because someone is putting their agenda above God's. And you want to know what's really funny? is that if you talk to the people that are in the middle of splitting a church up, either side will tell you, you're 100% right. But you know what they do? They say, and you need to go talk to them because that's exactly what they're doing. And they never look in the mirror and realize they're doing the same thing. We're putting our agenda above God's. And it has broken my heart over the years to watch people do this. 
to put their own petty differences or the fact that their feelings got hurt or they got mad about something or they didn't like something and, and, and to just say, you know what, I don't want anything more to do with you people, goodbye. And not just that, but what really breaks my heart as a pastor is that before they leave, they try to do as much damage as they possibly can. That they, they don't just want to go and take as many with them as they can, but they want to burn the place down before they go. I've never understood that. Never. There has never been another Christian that I hated so bad that I wanted God's work to be thwarted. And I think there's going to be some accountability for this, dear ones. God has a purpose, and everybody is putting their own agenda above it. Otherwise, his purpose would be accomplished more than it is. And it's heartbreaking. It shouldn't be that way. And if you see a functional church, and, and, and this is one of the things that I will stand up and salute. You know, I, I didn't mean to, but maybe it got perceived that I was taking a crack at bigger churches earlier. I will tell you one thing about churches that are larger, is that they have figured this out. And there's, there's a, a cumulative sense of, here's what our mission is. Here's what's most important. And we're going to put this aside. Now, it's possible for smaller churches to do that, too. And I know it's what God wants. For us to be so united in purpose that there's nothing else more important. You know, people always ask me, well, how do you deal with the church? Because people hurt your feelings all the time. And, and I went to church for a while and I had a bad experience. I always bear one thing in mind. God's agenda is preeminent. It's more important than me or my feelings or what somebody might say to me or how I might like or not like something that gets done to me the most important thing is that he wants to make himself known to a lost world and it's our job to do it and i don't want him to show up and ask me how much did i work to try to make him known and say well not much but you know whose fault it is theirs i don't think god's going to be impressed with that and i want to be a part of his purpose. The second thing that I want is to experience the power that comes when we're really a community. You know, there is something mysterious and wondrous about when a church is united, and I don't care what size it is. If they are truly united, if they really do enter into one mind, one purpose, you know how you can always tell? right after it ends. Everybody plays nice during the service because you're afraid what might God do, do to you if you don't. But watch people afterwards. You can always tell the ones who understand what community is because they tend to stick around. Not because they have to, but because they want to. Now I got you. None of you are going to want to leave early because you're not going to have the, the evil eye put on you. But I see it all the time. It's music to my ears as a shepherd of when I hear you guys talking with one another, introducing yourself, especially to people you don't know, and building relationships. Beloved, that's the core of what Christian community is supposed to be about. And I've, and I've seen both ends of the perspective. I've been in places where that was so powerful that you could just feel it when you walked in. And I've been in places where it was so cold you could have hung meat in the corner. Matter of fact, sometimes it's the same place at different times. God wants to reveal his power. It says, verse 33a, with great power they were doing this. Verse 33b, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. You know, whenever I feel like giving up, and yes, pastors sometimes feel like giving up. Matter of fact, you'd be amazed at the statistics of how many people are exiting the ministry these days. Whenever I feel like that, I have to be reminded that we serve a God of power and a God of transformation. And when his grace is brought to bear on a circumstance, no matter how dire it may appear, change will come. God's power. When you come into a congregation, you ought to be able to feel the power emanating from it. You know, as, I, as a kid, um, 
we, we took a tour one time of Friant Dam. And we actually went inside of the dam. And we got to go and see the uh, hydroelectric uh, generators that are inside. Those. They let the water loose and it spins these things and it creates electricity. And it was impressive. Because as you're going past these enormous machines, you can feel it. You can feel it. There's almost like a hum to it. And you can feel the electricity that's being generated. Beloved, when you walk into a church that is what God wants it to be, a church that is united in, in mind and in heart, you can feel his power emanating from it. And these are dynamic places. Places where when the individuals leave that building, wherever it is, those, that dynamic spreads into their relationships with their friends, with their family, with their neighbors, with the people they work with, the people they go to school with, the people they interact with. That power just flows because it can't be stopped. And if it isn't flowing, there is something interfering. And God wants that power to flow. He wants to make his name known. How's he going to do it? If you were God and you were looking down on your church, and you knew what you wanted from them, but it wasn't happening. How would you fix it? I'll tell you what God does, and it's replete in the scripture. Do you know why this church was flowing this power? Do you know why these people didn't look at their possessions as being their own? They were willing to share with strangers, sell things. Do you know why the gospel was being proclaimed so boldly? Do you know why they weren't afraid even though they were being legitimately threatened with hardship and many of them were going to face it? You know why? Because of the hardship. God's people traditionally do far better when times are bad than they do when times are good. Look at Israel's history during the time of the judges. When were they a dysfunctional mess? When everything was going great. When did they cry out to God? When God lifted up their enemies to punish them every single time. The church today is experiencing financial blessing. And we have experienced in this country for many, many years the freedom to do what we wanted. As a matter of fact, we, we used to have a great voice in the governance of this nation. And what has all of that prosperity brought about in us? We're corrupted by sin. We couldn't find holiness with both hands. We're divided against one another. We're shrinking in number. We are a laughing stock to the world. And no one wants to honor and obey God. Now you're God and you're looking at this. Do the math. What do you think God's going to do? Do you ever wonder why the world is becoming what it's becoming around us? Why the church and its influence is crumbling? Because God is saying, I want this fixed. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to withdraw my protection. I'm going to withdraw my blessing. And I am going to turn you to the mercy of the wolves. And you know what you're going to do? Two things. One, the false is going to run for the hills. The false is going to be exposed for what it is. The corruption is going to be excised from the community the way they used to remove people that had leprosy from the camp of Israel. It's going, my church is going to be purged. It's going to be holy. And then it's going to rise and come to life. Beloved, that is what is in our future. And I mean our near future. And it gives me no joy to tell you that. But I'll tell you what, in my heart, I have been praying, God, would you do whatever you gotta do? And in my spirit, I sense he is. So, the community is about purpose, it's about power, and then, Here's the wonderful thing. It's about provision. Verse 34, there were no needy persons among them. As I shared with you before, Deuteronomy 15, 4, there doesn't need to be any poor people among you, for God's going to bless you. 
You know, God provides for our needs. Financially is wonderful, but so much more. You know, in every congregation, there are people who come there in need. And God wants to meet those needs. It's one of the most winsome things about the church is that when people come in from the outside and they're looking for hope and they're looking for answers, they ought to feel that power emanating and then those things need to be addressed and cared for by people who are filled with God's spirit and have the courage to do it. And beloved, he's going to wake us up from our lethargy and it's going to be a good thing, even though I know it's a scary thing. It's going to be a good thing because people, no matter what they say, are looking for it. You know, I, I, I think there's hope for the church because I know how powerful it is when God really begins to invade his people and fill them up. And we can have such an effect on a world that's looking for it. Let me tell you a story. This is from a guy named Christopher Spata. He's a writer for a newspaper, the Tampa Bay Times. He writes this. As the sun rises over the bay in Vinoy Park in St. Petersburg, Florida, lounging on a bench near the seawall, his bench, is 58-year-old Al Nixon. Hi, Al, say the passers-by. Have a good day, says Al. For park regulars between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m., He's as reliable as the squirrels or the water fountains. Many who pass stop to chat. Some just give and receive a little wave. Day after day, Al has watched the sunrise from his bench seven days a week for years. Everyone seems to know him. It all began about seven years ago. Al needed to clear his head. It was trouble at work, mostly. He found the perfect bench near the seawall and watched the sun come up. It worked. So he started showing up for sunrise three or four days a week. One day, a complete stranger came up and told Al something that he'll never forget. When I see you sitting there, I know that everything is going to be all right. Al said, for the first time, I knew there was more of a purpose to me being out here than just soothing my own woes. I think we have an impact on other people. Not only did he keep coming, but it became every day, even weekends. He had to do his duty. Something else happened when he showed up every day. People started sitting down next to him and confiding in him. They told him about their children their own childhoods, their finances, even their marriages. At the height of the pandemic, people told Al about loved ones that they had lost. Al said, mostly people just want to be heard. I've heard a thousand stories. I don't consider myself all that smart or debonair, but I'm a good listener. Then at 8 a.m. sharp, an alarm sounded on his phone. Al stood up and walked off. He headed to work, feeling like his job was already done. The picture here. There he is. Al Nixon. Average guy. He first goes to this place because he himself is struggling. And something about it, just God's creation, makes him start to feel better. So he goes back so that he can deal with all the stuff he's dealing with at work. And he finds, accidentally, that he begins to have an impact on other people. Beloved, what might God do through us if we began to sense his purpose? As we seek him to have our needs met, he not only meets them, but begin, begins to turn us around to start reaching other people. Beloved, this is powerful stuff. This is just an old man sitting on a park bench. You know that I read further in the article, he actually uh, got sick 
And then after he got sick, he wound up going on a brief vacation to sort of recover. Do you know that they actually put a plaque on this bench because they thought he had died? They put a memorial plaque to Al, good friend. We're, we're going to miss him. He was so shocked when he came back and he saw a plaque. He said, apparently I died. So he was out there. He said, people were stunned like they'd seen a ghost when he came back. And they were so overjoyed. Some, most of them hugged him and thanked him. He thinks it's funny that he sits over the plaque that commit, commemorates his own death. And yet, that's how important this one guy is. Beloved, what might all of us do collectively if we came to an agreement, heart and mind? What God wants to do is the most important thing, and I want to be a part of it. Oh, that God would do that in your hearts. Because there is no better example of somebody digging up that treasure and selling everything they have to own it than that. And so, Father, I just pray this morning that you'll build a community here. It can start small, God. This is a beleaguered place. The enemy has done great harm here, Lord. But I pray you would bring healing. I pray you would bring revival. I pray you, you would send power and boldness and courage and a desire to unite with our brothers and sisters and to care about them even the ones we don't know all that well, that we would stop building our own kingdoms and start selling it off to have yours. Oh, God, do a work here, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy the game. We'll see you next Sunday.